When we praise a game for atmosphere, what do we mean by that? Is it equal parts audio and visual? Is atmosphere synonymous with immersion? Can gameplay itself add to an atmosphere? And if so, how? It's a concept that given time, we may be able to arrive at a definition, and we'd be far from the first people to define atmosphere. In 2012, during a talk about atmosphere at GDC, Greg Kasavin, writer and designer at Supergiant Games, said this. I think we all have an intuitive understanding of what atmosphere is. It's like, uh, if you've played an atmospheric game, you kind of know it when you play it. I'd agree with Kasavin here. We know atmosphere when we play it, and when discussing some of the most well-constructed, mesmerizing atmospheres in gaming, it never takes long before someone brings up the Stalker series, which began with 2007's Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl. Developed by GSC Game World, Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl is a semi-tactical survival horror FPS taking place across multiple sandbox levels, each drenched in tension and danger. Having survived a car crash and losing much of his memory, the main character, simply known as the Marked One, embarks on a mysterious adventure into The Zone, a fictionalized version of the real Chernobyl exclusion zone in northern Ukraine that encompasses the towns of Chernobyl and Pripyat. Stalker is a confluence of two major inspirations, first of which is the Chernobyl accident of 1986, when the Chernobyl nuclear power plant exploded, contaminating a large area around it and making much of it uninhabitable. And while this disaster provides a backdrop to Stalker's world, narratively, Stalker, I think, is more deeply connected with Russian filmmaker Andrei Tarkovsky's 1979 movie, also titled Stalker. Tarkovsky's Stalker is a delicately paced discussion about human desire reconciling truth, science, and art. It's far more metaphysical fiction than science fiction, coded in thick layers of symbolism and metaphor. The main character, known only as Stalker, guides clients through a place called The Zone, an ambiguously dangerous, undefined area wherein lies a room that can grant you your deepest wish. While GSC Stalker is set in the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone, it's Tarkovsky's mysticism that drives much of the story. High levels of radiation aren't the only reason the zone is dangerous. As you'll learn not too far into the story, a mysterious object called the Monolith dropped into the middle of the zone. Rumors abound this object could, for those close enough, grant wishes. It's easy and not unreasonable to disregard GSC's connection with Tarkovsky as skin deep. The two are, in many ways, nothing alike. While Tarkovsky Tarkovsky's Stalker is a mystical guide with an esoteric understanding of the zone, GSC Stalkers are closer to mercenaries that take risky jobs in the zone to find treasure or uncover secrets. At its heart, Stalker is an action game that's heavy on survival elements with a side of horror and a dash of RPG mechanics. The world is dark, gray, and gloomy. Packs of mutants and hostile stalkers roam the wilds. Pockets of radiation and strange, deadly paranormal anomalies pollute the landscape. GSC wants you immersed in this world to always be aware of your surroundings. Notice your inventory screen and PDA, which is where you'll find quests, the world map, and more. Don't pause the game when you open them. When you get close to a pocket of radiation or one of Stalker's anomalies, a proximity alert will sound, but it won't tell you in which direction the danger lies. At this, GSC succeeds. Stalker's world is deeply immersive and, while it may look dead, is very much alive. You'll encounter loads of different wildlife, sometimes hostile and often unpredictable, and factions of different Stalkers that vie for control of the zone. Your interactions with these factions matter and change the world around you, helping one faction action could make you enemies with another. Between inventory management, which includes gear that degrades over use, how often you'll see combat, and the overall open world, Stalker finds a really unique blend of action and survival horror. Whereas horror franchises like Resident Evil limit what you can carry through inventory space, Stalker substitutes space with weight. Everything that goes in your inventory, from weapons to ammo and health, counts toward weight. The heavier you are, the shorter your sprint lasts and the longer it takes to recover. Cover. Carry enough stuff and you won't be able to move at all. You're not only making survival decisions, like how much food to carry to stave off hunger and balancing that with health items and ammunition, you're also making tactical decisions. Enemies generally don't take many hits before dying, but neither do you. This is where I'd consider Stalker semi-tactical. Resources aren't always abundant, but combat is, and you'll want to come out of combat gaining more resources than you spent. This means using cover, leaning, 
and approaching combat with a plan. Compounding this is Stalker's Ballistics, which is robust enough to change your approach to combat. It's not only accuracy and damage that varies among weapons, fire rate, versatility, and stability change by tangible degrees. For example, the AKM-74 II is a common rifle you'll find pretty early on. It has automatic and semi-automatic firing modes and, if you find one, can equip a scope. The TRS-301 is a less common rifle that appears about a third of the way in. It also can equip a scope and has automatic, semi-automatic, and a three-round burst firing mode. The TRS-301 is the superior weapon, but their biggest difference is the type of ammo they use. The AKM-74 II uses much more common 5.45, and the TRS-301 uses 5.56. Because weapons break down as you use them, it may be beneficial to use a weapon like the AKM-74 II over the TRS-301. It's easier to replace and find ammo for. Now you can carry as many weapons as you want, barring weight, but only equip one sidearm and one main weapon at a time. This means if you do decide to carry a variety of weapons and ammo, when the situation calls for it, you have to manually switch which weapon is equipped. This takes time and leaves you exposed. Personally, after trying a few playstyles, I found it most effective to focus on a single weapon and save weight for health and ammo. This strategy isn't foolproof. Occasionally, Stalker funnels its gameplay. Whether you're exploring a building or following a quest that leads you underground, Stalker changes pace with the horror side of its combat. Invisible monsters and agile mutants rush at you and attack on sight. Conventional tactics change. You'll have to shoot and reload on the move. In these situations, conserving ammo and health may be more difficult. And unlike human enemies, monsters don't drop health or ammo, so the resources you expend may not be returned. This semi-realistic gunplay in mind, you might have noticed that every time Marked One equips a weapon, he chambers around. Also, the vast majority of Stalker's weapons, if not all, eject their casings to the left. I'm nowhere near a weapons expert, but generally speaking, most modern weapons eject bullet casings to the right. I don't think it's an inaccuracy, it's not the only game to do this, and I'd assume it was done to make things more exciting and add to Stalker's thick immersion. Whatever your playstyle, you'll be scavenging a lot in Stalker. Traders here and there sell equipment, but it's an expensive route to go down, especially early on. Light RPG mechanics get thrown in with outfits and artifacts. Outfits are relatively standard. Some are made for combat, and others will give you protection from high radiation. Artifacts are far more customizable. They'll boost stats like stamina and come with negative side effects like radiation. Artifacts can change the game. You're allowed five equipped artifacts, which you can swap at will, and their effects stack. Collect enough artifacts that, for example, buff stamina, and you'll be able to sprint indefinitely. Stalker's inventory management and combination of semi-realistic gunplay within an action survival horror setting is creative as it is impressive. With that, Stalker is, in many ways, very rough around the edges. Even with the language set to English, there's still dialogue, some of it important in Ukrainian, and without modding it, Stalker has no subtitles. Most dialogue happens in text-based dialogue boxes, all of which fortunately is translated and sometimes even narrated. Occasionally, though, that narration doesn't match up with the text. Stalker often fails to to communicate certain things, specifically when it comes to storytelling and quest objectives. It can be a little confusing following along. Checking your PDA regularly, specifically the diary, will provide a fuller context of what's happening around you and make things easier to grasp. Stalker does have some great thought-provoking writing. The ingredients for a gripping and unexpected science fiction tale are there. It's just all mishandled. When Marked One wakes up for the first time, his PDA has listed one goal to find and kill a stalker named Straylock. What follows is a series of jobs to uncover information about Straylock, his comrades, and the true nature of the zone itself. Most quests constitute your standard FPS action adventure. Go here and find this. Go here and activate this. It doesn't require much thought, nor ask the player to consider deeper, stronger themes, which in a vacuum is fine, but this breaks down at Stalker's end. Stalker has seven endings, five of which are bad and two good. The bad endings are very easy to get, happen abruptly, leave more questions unanswered than answered, and really just don't make a whole lot of sense. If you 
solely follow Stalker's main questline, you'll get one of the bad endings, which are variations of the same scene. After fighting through bad guys and making his way to the monolith, Marked One makes a wish. The wish he makes, and thus the cutscene that plays, depends on a number of factors, including money you've accumulated if you've killed certain NPCs and if you've failed to do side quests. In an act of bitter irony, whatever Marked One wishes for is thrown back on him. The ending I got, for example, is what the wiki calls the greedy ending. Marked One walks up to the monolith, wishes he were rich, and the monolith gives him the illusion it's raining gold before crashing the building down on top of him. For a few reasons, this ending confused me. Toward the game's end, the monolith's location is revealed, sparking a gold rush of sorts. Factions hurry to the zone center in order to take hold of it. While Marked One is drawn to the monolith too, Stalker never explains exactly what he wants to do once he's there. Before my ending, I was under the assumption I was going to protect the monolith or learn more about it. Instead, I was crushed by a steel beam. According to the wiki, all you need to do at the end is have more than 50,000 rubles to get the greedy ending. This doesn't really explain why the marked one I played was greedy or why and how, after fighting through monsters and losing much of his memory, he suddenly wanted to be rich. It's arbitrary. Part of this may have, quite literally, been lost in translation. As you near the monolith, it repeatedly speaks to you, but the voice isn't translated. The wiki lists what the monolith says, and if accurate, it does paint a more foreboding picture. Even then, these themes of greed and arrogance that the bad endings possess aren't pressed throughout Stalker's story. Rather, they materialize at the very end. To GSC's credit, the monolith's deception does match up with Tarkovsky. Stalker closes with a harsh, careful what you wish for message, but this motif isn't just proclaimed in the final scene of the film, it's built up to. It's a theme that's threaded into the characters and dialogue. Had GSC portrayed Marked One as selfish, hypocritical, or deceitful throughout the game, it would have made more sense. Stalker's two good endings are much better and give the bad endings an important dose of context. Problem is, they aren't executed well either. About three-fourths of the way through Stalker's main questline, you'll get a separate quest to talk with a stalker named Guide. Follow the questline Guide gives you and you'll find Stalker's alternate good endings. Guide's questline, however, appears inconspicuously. If you have a few quests stacked up, it'll appear in your PDA like any other unfinished side quest. It doesn't come off as significant. Furthermore, to activate the quest, you have to go back to Stalker's opening area. Stalker doesn't have fast travel, meaning you'll have to backtrack through enemies for a few minutes and, especially on harder difficulties, risk spending resources on something that's out of the way and seemingly unimportant. If you do follow Guide's questline, you'll learn along the way that you've been Straylock the whole time, that the monolith is a trap that doesn't actually grant wishes, and that the entire zone is a result of science gone wrong. A group of scientists attempted to make a super consciousness so powerful they could rid the world of anger, greed, and other unsavory emotions. It obviously didn't work. You're given the choice to either kill the scientists, which makes the zone disappear and is the canonical ending, or join Straylock's consciousness with theirs, ending the game on uncertain interpretive grounds. That's a whole lot packed in two of seven endings and an odd way to treat your canonical ending. If Stalker were a shorter, more easily traversed experience, this ending would be fine. But Stalker is open world, you can spend hours exploring and doing side quests and collecting better gear. If you don't have a convenient save or know when to save, you may have to redo hours of gameplay to get one of the two good endings. It's funny, when I reviewed 2019's Metro Exodus, I kept thinking it reminded me of Stalker's Shadow of Chernobyl. The Metro series is one started by developers who worked on Stalker. Metro, known for being relatively linear, opened up with Exodus and became action survival horror that included a few open-ended sandboxes as levels. If you watch the review, you'll notice I don't say that Exodus reminds me of Shadow of Chernobyl because, at the time, it had been years since I played it, so I wasn't sure if I was remembering it accurately. But now that I have, I can say it did inspire a lot of Exodus, and besides Stalker's own sequels, I don't know if there's another series or game that succeeded in recreating Stalker's atmospheric, semi-tactical, action survival horror style over an open world. More than a decade after release, Shadow of Chernobyl remains both influential and somewhat unmatched.